Hello, my name is Eric Wiseman. I'm an Associate Professor of Urban and Community Forestry in the Department of Forest Resources and Environmental Conservation at Virginia Tech. Today I'm here at Eureka Park in Roanoke City talking about tree physiology and anatomy. Tree physiology is the study of the biological processes that go on inside the tree and is the consequence of the structure of the tree, the anatomy, doing its jobs to help the tree grow and survive in its environment. There are four primary physiological processes that we'll talk about. Photosynthesis, respiration, transpiration, and translocation. Photosynthesis is the process by which trees capture energy from the sun and store it in carbohydrates. This energy source then drives the metabolism of the tree, growth, reproduction, and defense. The way that this energy is used is through the process of respiration, which releases energy from the carbohydrates. Transpiration is the process of moving water from the soil up through the trunk, into the branches, and then through the foliage. This water pathway is what delivers essential elements from the soil into the foliage. And then translocation is the process of moving those carbohydrates that are made in photosynthesis from the foliage to places where they will be stored or consumed. We call this flow source to sink, meaning that it flows, it flows along a, a gradient of concentration, typically moving downward from the leaves to lower parts in the tree. Trees are classified into two major categories, angiosperms, which we commonly know as our broadleaf plants, and gymnosperms, which we commonly refer to as our conifers. Despite these two distinct groups, they each have fairly similar wood cells and tissues. And now we want to talk about those in a little more detail. So first of all, I'll start out with the angiosperm. I have an example here of a northern red oak, Quercus rubra. Working from the outside to the inside, we begin with the outer bark. The outer bark serves as the skin for the tree that keeps the tree from drying out, as well as keeps pests and pathogens and extreme temperatures from harming the tissues on the inside. To the interior of that is the inner bark, also known as the phloem. This is the tissue that transports photosynthates or sugars from their source to their sink. Interior to that is the lateral meristem, also known as the vascular cambium. These are the cells that give rise to new tissues to the inside, the sapwood, and then new tissues to the outside, the phloem and the bark. To the inside of the vascular cambium is the xylem. It's also referred to as sapwood, and then as the stem gets older in some species, the heartwood. The heartwood, that is age-altered wood. It is no longer active in translocation or storage, but it serves as a dumping ground uh, for the tree that ages out over time as the tree grows older. Here we have a stem cross-section of an eastern white pine, Pinus strobitz, and it's a great example of a gymnosperm. Very similar tissues as we saw in the angiosperm. Working from the outside in, we again have an outer bark, we have an inner bark or phloem, a vascular cambium, which is the lateral meristem, and then we have xylem that comprises the sapwood. These all tissues that have a very similar function in the gymnosperm as they do in the angiosperm. As stems grow older and enlarge in diameter, they begin to split the bark. This gives rise to the distinctive ridges, plates, and scales that we see that are distinctive of various species. In this northern red oak, Quercus rubra, the stem is still young and therefore the bark is still tight and smooth. However, here we have a nice example of more mature bark on a flowering dogwood, Cornus florida. You can see that the bark has begun to develop these very distinct ridges and furrows that are indicative that the bark is maturing as the tree has gotten older. Trees grow larger and branches and trunks grow wider in diameter by developing annual growth rings. This is the process through which the vascular cambium or lateral meristem lays down a new layer of phloem and xylem with each year's new growth. Over time, these growth rings become distinctive and they can be seen when a stem is cut, cut in cross-section. The size of these annual growth rings 
is directly related to the growth rate of the tree over its lifespan. And the size of these annual growth rings can be quite variable depending on the species and the quality of its growing environment. As an example, I have a couple of wood samples here to show that. First of all, a very rapid growing tree. This is a loblolly pine, Pinus taeda. And you can see in the center of this beam is the pith of the stem. And then you can see the alternating light and dark bands of annual growth rings. This block of wood is only about seven years worth of growth. In contrast, here we have a stem cross section from a bur oak, Quercus macrocarpa. You can see the pith in the center and the bark to the outside. And then very subtly, you can see concentric rings of annual growth rings. In this case, this particular stem was growing very, very slowly. And so although this is a really small diameter stem, it's about 45 years old when you count the growth rings. Let's talk about flower and fruit of trees. Of course, earlier we learned about our angiosperms and gymnosperms. So here's a good example of gymnosperm leaves. These are the needles on a conifer, the Norway spruce, Picea abies. We have a good example of a broadleaf deciduous species. We have pin oak, Quercus palustris. And then we have an example of an angiosperm broadleaf evergreen, southern magnolia, Magnolia grandiflora. Angiosperms and gymnosperms are differentiated as being flowering and non-flowering plants. But the gymnosperms, they have a more ancient form of reproduction in which they use stroboli to reproduce. These stroboli, also known as cones, are where the seeds are contained in the tree. These will be shed at the end of the growing season and will turn into the next generation of conifers. Reproduction in angiosperms is much more diverse. These are the flowering plants, and they have many different flower types, and then ultimately many different fruit types. In this example, we have a pin oak, Quercus palustris, and we can see the mature fruit, which is an acorn. And then here we have a southern magnolia, Magnolia grandiflora, which mature fruit are these droops that are contained in this aggregate fruit. An interesting thing about conifers is that many species are wind pollinated. That means that the pollen is carried to the female reproductive parts of the cone, sometimes over great distances. Many angiosperms are also wind pollinated. For example, the oaks, their pollen is carried from the catkin to the female flower, which results in pollination and the development of an acorn. Many species of angiosperms are insect pollinated. This means that an insect visits the flowers on one tree, picks up pollen from the flower, and then moves it to the pistil on the flowers of another tree and fertilizes them and turns into a fruit like we see with the droop here on the southern magnolia. Another example of an angiosperm species that is insect pollinated is sourwood, Oxydendrum arboreum. Here, one of the primary pollinators are honeybees. They will carry pollen from one tree to the flowers of another tree. And of course, we know that the honeybees make sourwood honey, which many people enjoy. Leaf and branch arrangement is a key way that we differentiate various species of trees. With our conifers, oftentimes we look at the number of needles that are attached in a fascicle, as well as looking at the orientation or arrangement of the needles. In angiosperms, we look at both leaf arrangement as well as leaf type to differentiate species. With branch arrangement, we have three different types, alternate, opposite, and, and world branching. And then with leaf types, we have simple leaves and we have compound leaves. Here we have two good examples of compound leaves, one being an oppositely branching species. This is green ash, Fraxinus pennsylvanica, oppositely branched, and the pinnately compound leaves and here we have another example of a pinnately compound leaf species. This is mockernut hickory, Caria tomentosa, but it has alternate branching. <laughs>